Hey guys, Alex from Board Game Co over here, and today we're doing 10 games that are better than Risk. Now, I did another list like this, another list like this a little earlier called 10 Games Better Than Monopoly. I'll link that up above. But the basic idea is to specifically, Risk is a very popular game, as we all know. Risk is a game that we've grown up with. We've played it a lot. Many of us, myself, mo probably most of you watching, have at one point or another played Risk. Now, the, there are a lot of games in this dudes on a map genre. The, the the general name for games in that category where you're fighting with guys across a map and whatnot, taking territory and all that, is generally referred to as a dudes on a map game. And there are a lot of better dudes on a map games out there. Risk is great. I have lots of fond memories of playing Risk. When I think back to games like Monopoly, I don't think Monopoly is an enjoyable game. If you do, that's great. But I did think Risk was enjoyable. Risk was a, was a great game. Lots of major Amazing memories with my, with my siblings just destroying each other while one of us bunkered down in Australia or whatnot. And then from there we discovered Risk 2210, which you haven't played that and you like Risk, I recommend giving that a shot. Risk 2210 was a good board game before I got into all of these board games, these things behind me and whatnot. There are there's a lot of fun things to be had in this genre. There's a lot of amazing moments. But Risk at its core, while it does distill uh, but while it does give you a lot of those fun moments, it also suffers from some things that are generally categorized under bad game design. Things like player elimination, things like incentivizing players to bunker down and to turtle down in Australia, turtle down in South Africa and just build up troops. There are a lot of elements of game design that, while the core is a great system, this dude's on a map system, at the same time, Risk itself is a good game and not a great game. And so here's this list, my top 10 games that are better than Risk, that are all in the dudes in a map genre, fighting each other, area control, taking over, but giving you more out of the experience. And starting off with number one, number one is actually a game I no longer own, but don't get me wrong, it's an amazing game. Number one is Small World. Small World was in the first batch of games that I got when I first got into this kind of gaming. And Small World really does distill that feeling and experience into a very simple, very accessible gameplay experience. The basic idea of Small World is you have these player powers. So you have races and then you have powers. And the races and powers just mix and match completely randomly as you set up the game. So one game you have flying dwarfs. The next game you have, uh, you know, Elves that can turtle across the board, that can, that can teleport from cave to cave. There's all these different powers and abilities. And the next round, you have human farmers that are, you know, characters that are, will will give you more money for certain terrain types. But they're and they're, they're humans. They have their own fact that they'll be more defensive on a different terrain type. So there's all these different ways that these races and powers all combine. And the goal of the game is you don't actually get a race and power off the bat. You're not assigned a color or whatnot. Rather, through the course of the game, you pick that race. You pick that combination and then you try to do as much damage and destruction as you can until your race eventually goes into decline at which point you pick another one. The whole gameplay experience ultimately comes down to picking good combinations of races and powers, not just based on their own merits, but also based on the merits of your current board state, of the other player's current board state. Lots of powers, lots of fun. It was a great gameplay experience, and it continue, it's one of the most accessible, it's probably the most accessible game on this list. If you're coming straight out of Risk and you've never played any of these games, I recommend going straight to Small World. It is incredibly easy to pick up. It is beautifully produced. There's tons of expansions if you want more content. And while I do no longer own it, because because my game group has, has gone escalated to a higher level of gameplay, it is a great starting off point and I'll happily play it with you anytime. I have the app, I play the app, it's lots of fun, still a great game, that's Small World. Number two on the list is Nexus Ops, which I do own but is currently lent out to my brother. Nexus Ops is a, a two to four player game and it does play decently with two but I recommend it with three or four. It's again, it's a you know, fighting game, it's a well, dudes in a map, these games are all dudes in a map so I'm probably gonna exhaust certain words here saying them again, dudes, fighting, epic, all that but Nexus Ops is comes down to it's a very small board. It's a very small map. There's an element of area control because of the resource generation aspect of the game. We have to build up these resources that allow you to bring up more units on the board. And then there's a central area on the board that you're trying to really control to get as many points as possible. It is unlike Risk. Remember how I mentioned Risk incentivizes this concept of turtling, this concept of, of bunkering down in a place while you try to just grow as defensive as possible? Nexus Ops is the first but not the last game on this list that does the opposite of that. The game specifically and strongly incentivizes attack hacking. 
not being the one in the corner hoping no one attacks you and while you grow, but rather getting your troops out there, attacking with a gusto, building up different unit types that have different benefits or advantages over other unit types. It is a great next step from Small World. It's very, again, very accessible while also being very rewarding as you basically pummel each other to death. And it's an old game. This is actually might be the old, I think it is. I think this is the oldest game on this list. It's been reprinted, but it is one of the older games. It is the oldest game on this list, I believe. Number three on this list is Shogun. Shogun is where we start to escalate the level of strategy involved. Shogun, it takes place in feudal Japan, and you're basically a Shogun, and all the other players are Shoguns, and you're trying to mass your units in a way that it gives you the win, basically, which all these games, I tell you, I'm going to reuse these basic concepts. But the, the, the elegance of Shogun, the part of Shogun I love, is that Shogun has the this this planning mechanism where you sit there and you can kind of plan out which actions you're going to take at which point in the game sequence. Each round has 10 phases, so to speak, and you're putting different cards down in different territories to say, you know, you're going to put a movement card here so that from this territory you're going to move. And you're going to put another card here and that territory is going to tax. And you have all these this planning aspect that all goes face down and all gets revealed simultaneously. So you're trying to predict. It has, it has a fog of war mechanism that is very realistic and not just realistic because realistic isn't good enough but re realistic and rewarding it is you're trying to sit there and plan your turn not knowing what your opponents are going to do just like in real life you have to sit there and well i'm gonna defend this province i don't even know if anyone's attacking it but i have to plan for the possibility that they might and i'm gonna sit there and tax over here but in the meantime by the time it actually gets taxed their troops may have come and ca came in and stopped me from doing so because of the fact that you have to plan out multiple moves in advance while you wait and see how the round plays out, it is very strategically rewarding. It's very engaging. It is less beat em up in your face and far more tactical maneuvering as you try to position yourself for the ideal win. That is Shogun, and again, great game. I'm going to use the word great for every one of these. Number four on this list is Rising Sun, and I can finally start showing you boxes. So just to give you a recap, Small World, I no longer own, don't plan on getting back. Nexus Ops is on loan, and Shogun, I actually am in the middle of getting it back. I haven't played in a long time, looking forward. Rising Sun is another one that takes place in Japan. Well, uh, the artwork should probably tell you that. This is by Kaman Games, and it is part of their new trilogy. Well, n not new trilogy, new games, but now it's now a trilogy. It's part of Blood Rage, Rising Sun, Rising Sun, and Ankh, which I did a video on Ankh, which I'll link up above. But in Rising Sun, this is a game where they actually say it's kind of like risk meets diplomacy. There's an aspect, if you, have, if you haven't played diplomacy, diplomacy is what it sounds like. It's all about negotiating, all about talking to each other and trying to figure out who's going to do what in order so that you can win. Obviously, everyone's out for themselves, and when it comes down to it, that will be displayed, but throughout the course of the game, you can incentivize other people to do other things to your advantage. But Rising Sun, what it really does, is it starts off every round by having players actually ally so that they can benefit from each other's actions. You combine that combination of allegiances, of, of betrayal, of helping each other one round while you turn around and backstab each other the next round, combine that with a game that has an elegant combat mechanic of how they resolve battles in three different areas of you can either commit suicide, you can go for the win, you can go for capturing prisoners, there's all these ways to try to dominate a battle, and then combine that with a ton of cool miniatures awesome monsters that you'll be trying to acquire doing these actions during the round. These monsters will give you epic presence on the board that will both be intimidating to other players, but also change the entire power dynamic of the game. Suddenly there's a new monster on the board, and now that guy's no longer interested in actually winning the battle, but rather he wants to just take out your monster instead. It's a fascinating interplay of, of diplomacy, of attacking, of abilities, of powers, each race comes with their own, each each clan that you are comes with their own unique power that is going to give you a dynamic edge in the game. And again, it has that element of taxation, of the element of trying to acquire resources to do all the things you want to do. Rising Sun is an excellent, excellent game in the do's and a map genre. From there, we have Rurik Dawn of Kiev. Rurik Dawn of Kiev is an amazing game. Again, all these words. Rurik Dawn of Kiev is a great game that is all about it's all about trying to screw with your opponents. I mean, many of the games are, but it's all about trying to screw with your opponents by intimidating them into which action they will and won't choose. Rurik starts off each round, each of the four rounds, with a bidding phase. And that bidding phase, what you're doing is you're trying to sit there and say, well, I want this action. But the fun part of the bidding phase is your first your first bid, so to speak, your first placements of your guys, where you put them down, you're putting down your advisors on this board that could give you actions, they're going to get moved down. Now the interesting part is the best actions will the the, the 
in order to get the best actions, you have to put down your higher level advisors, but your higher level advisors act later in turn order. So again, it gives you the fog of war aspect in a whole different way, not in a way of, oh no, I have to wait and see what my opponent will play, but rather it gives you the fog of war because the things you're trying to do are going to be pushed around and prodded around, and by the time you resolve them, they may not be as good or ideal as you would have liked. It has this, this combination of this placement phase that gives you all your actions while making you struggle and regret every single decision you've ever made in your life up until this point. And then it follows it up with the actual resolution of the actions where you try to make the best with how things didn't work out the way you wanted. And not just doing that round, but even doing the round. People will come in and destroy your, your plans in a way that will make you adjust and pivot every single round. There's a lot going on and this is really, really a brain burner because of the amount of things going on and because of the amount of things that are uh, happening that you have to accommodate for and be willing to adjust from. But if you're okay with that, that, that thought process, if you're okay with that, it is a rewarding, rewarding experience as you sit there and screw with the people who were your friends two minutes ago. Number six on this list is Kemet. Kemet is, well, most of these are my one, amongst my favorite games, but Kemet is the first game in the Innis Kemet Cycladis trilogy from Madago Games. Now, I actually did a play this, not that video with the whole trilogy telling you which one's my favorite, but you'll also figure that out doing this list because I'm starting with Kemet. Kemet is all about powers. That's what it comes down to. If I had to sum up Kemet in one word, it would be epic powers. That's two words. I lied. Epic powers. Kemet is a game where you, the whole crux of the game is that you have a, panels of power tiles that are available to all players equally. You can sit there and you can specialize in the economic tiles that will give you all these additional economic incentives throughout the game. More ways to make money, more ways to make things cheaper. Alternatively, you can sit there in the defensive tiles that will help reward turtling to some degree or more specifically holding territories that are very useful, very beneficial. Or you can sit there and go with the attack tiles that will reward attacking and give you an edge when you're attacking. Any of these three lanes are things that you can buy and you can buy from all of them. It's not one or the other. You can buy from all of them in different ways, but you are going to have to specialize to a degree to get those higher, better tiles faster than other players. Now, in Kemet, like I said, everything is about those powers. The core of the game is a dudes in the map game where you're moving your guys around the game, around the board, and attacking people gives you a point. Every time you win a battle as the attacker, you get one of the 10 points needed for a victory. That is a huge deal. If you win 10 battles, you basically won the game if you win 10 battles faster than your opponents, obviously. But it combines other elements of gameplay of holding certain key territory spots to additionally get uh, victory points. Or you can level up your pyramids, which are the things that give you access to those power tiles. And again, you'll get victory points that way. The game is all about attacking, and the fact that you get points as the attacker, not as the defender, incentivize a brutal cutthroat combat where every round is multiple battle after battle as people smash each other's heads into the ground while buying more powers to make next round even cooler when you smash your opponent's heads into the ground in newer, interesting, more creative ways. Kemet is it's just a brilliantly fun gameplay experience every single time it hits the table, not because it's the most balanced game on planet Earth, not because there aren't exceptions of this, that, and these rules, and this, this way where you can combine these and ultimately win. It has a lot of small flaws like that, but it is just amazingly fun because of all those powers that everyone had equal access to. The game has small levels of being broken, small levels, but everyone has equal access to them, and if you know about them, you can plan around them. Kemet is actually coming out with a new Kickstarter this year, Kemet Blood in the Sand or something like that. I'll obviously be doing a video on that as well. Number seven on the list is Empire's Age of Discovery. This is a heavy box. Empire's Age of Discovery, whoa. This is a game I have only played a handful of times, maybe four or five times, but I wanna play it a lot more. Now this one I debated including in this list because this more than anything else on this list, it doesn't necessarily fall as clearly into the dudes on a map genre, but it felt so similar since this whole basis of this list was games that are better than Risk while having elements of Risk. It felt very strongly like a Risk style game, even though it branches out into a worker placement genre, which is a whole nother way of playing games. Now the good news is, if you play this game and if you like it, try out worker placement games. There's a whole host of them available, and this is amongst my favorite from, from worker placement games. This is a worker placement slash area control game. The area control is the dudes and map aspect of risk, and the worker placement is how you get all these advantages that will help you throughout the game. Do you want to invest in certain character types that will give you different advantages to, to ships, to captains, to exploring, to having a presence on the board, to building buildings? There's all these different characters that can reward you that way. Do you instead want to specifically go and buy buildings that 
that will give you unique advantages in that sense? Do you want to colonize and get your guys on the map as fast as possible to both score those area control points and also be stronger if push comes to shove in any battles? There are a lot of different competing aspects to this game, competing aspects that push you in different directions of how to meet the need to win. Ultimately, this is a game about points and you have to figure out the most efficient way to get those points. There's a limited economy, there's a limited budget, there's limited land for everyone to settle. There are limited spots for people to go. This is all about a combination of placing guys down and getting there first, and then battling things out on the main board. There is a lot going on here, there's a lot to absorb. This is a game that every single strategy you can think of has a counterplay that someone else can involve themselves in in order to push for a win in a different directions. And then it has these buildings. Like I said, I love powers and in this game, the buildings are the powers. Every round there are new buildings that come out that will give you a different unique advantage, an advantage that other players will not share and a way for you to escalate that win condition while your other players just can't keep up because you have some sort of special ability that they no longer have. It is a combination worker placement area control game, which I just said, but it is it is, it is an, very rewarding. Every time I play this game, it takes it takes a long time. It takes three to four hours easily, but it, I always want to play it again and again and again. Next on this list, we have number eight, Cyclades. Cyclades is the next game in that Kemet in his Cyclades trilogy, and it's a, another worker placement game, and not not worker placement, not, another dudes in a map game, and another epic, incredible experience. Now, Cyclades, it, unlike Kemet, where I said Kemet is all about powers, Cyclades is about timing. That is the way I would pin, pin down Cyclades. Everything in the game comes down to doing the right thing at the right time and it's it's so amazing to play that out and to get that experience to to push for the win not because you have the mass strength but because no one else can stop you because of timing the first part of Cyclades always comes down to bidding for a god's favor and that god's favor is going to give you a unique ability for the round are you interested in moving your ships across the board are you interested in moving your your, your troops across the board do you want to invest in, in priests and temples that will make other things in the game cheaper each god will give you a different unique competitive advantage for the round but the most important thing the thing that blows my mind every time is if you you invest in Ares, if you get the god who lets you move your units, no one else is moving their units that round. They can move their ships, they can they can engage in all these extra monster abilities and whatnot, but nobody else will be moving their units. This is what I mean when I say the game is about timing. The game is all about setup, all about taking one turn to position your ships this way, another turn to get a few temples and hopefully buy a creature, and then the third turn ensuring that you win Ares, at which point you sweep into two new territories, kicking out your opponents and taking over a metropolis, taking over another building. It is all about setting up those perfect turns across a multitude of rounds and then executing your actions while other people are trying to do the same. Just because you want Ares, just because your perfect turn doesn't involve Ares, someone else also wants Ares that turn and now it's a question of who has the most money. Or alternatively, do you sit there and have a backup plan in place where you bid him up, you bid him up, but then as soon as he takes arrows, you take Apollo and you shelter down and you get another resource production in your colony, and next turn you get Ares and clean up after the weakened colonies taking over the territory. There are so many things you can do in this game, and they all come down not to what you do, but rather when you do it. If you like the idea of being outbid when it's going to tear your guts out, when you needed that god to win the game, if you like the idea of outbidding someone else when they needed something, and then taking it away from them, if you want to build up an economy, if you want to build up units, if you want to build up sh uh, ships and, and monsters and all these things to, to help you win the game, Cyclades lets you do all of it and lets you feel like a master when you win the game. It lets you feel like you earned it, like you you sat there and you you timed it out, you, you you anticipated your opponent's moves, and you got the win. Next up on this list is Innis. Number nine on this list is Innis. Innis is a great, great game. Again, I keep doing that, I'm sorry. Just Great's just a standard go-to word. Innis is an elegant game. You know I said Cyclades is about timing? Innis is about elegance. In Innis, ultimately what you have is you have 17 cards. 17 cards that are going to define your actions for the round. You can't move in this game as an action. You can't just do stuff. Everything you do comes down to the cards cards you draft. The cards you draft are going to be what lets you move, what lets you attack, what lets you get units. Everything in the game comes down to those 17 cards and you're going to draft them. You take four cards, pick one, pass the rest. Take four cards, so we'll take three cards, pick one, pass the rest. You're going to acquire your action cards through that drafting round and then take those four different actions as the game plays out. 
It's all about the elegance of a handful of specific actions that are always available in the game. Every round you know that there's a maximum of four cards that will let people move around the board. There's a maximum number of troops that can possibly enter the board based on those same cards. One of the cards is a Geist card that will stop, basically cancel someone else's card. You want to save that for when the timing is perfect. You want to you want to bluff that you have it when you don't. You're like, oh, oh, wait one second, let me just read. Oh, okay, fuck, I am. You want to bluff out players. You want to, you want to, sit there and let other people take their actions and then clean up after them. But the risk of that is if people pass, you might lose your ability to actually take a turn. There is so much going on in this game, but it's all about the elegance of knowing the, the limited availability of actions available and then trying to sit there and conquer the right territory that will give you an additional card that will help you do something else. Or maybe you draw an epic tail card, which is a whole nother style, a whole nother card deck that will give you additional actions, and those cards stay round to round. So suddenly it's no longer four actions, but it's four plus a few you've been saving up. There's all these different things you can do in the game, and one of the things I love most about Innis, compared to let's say Kemet and Cyclades, and Kemet and Cyclades ultimately having a lot of troops is a good thing. It will, there will often be a correlation between strength and winning. In Innis, no such correlation exists. Strength has its advantages, do not get me wrong. Having a bunch of troops when another opponent can't actually do much about that does have its advantages. But there are just as many advantages as being in the right place at the right time. And so often in Innis, the person who wins the game, at least in my experience, in our group's experience, is not the person with the most power, but rather the person with the most planning. The person who sat there and mapped out everyone else's moves and tried to figure out what people are going to do on their turn. And then once everyone is done, they pounced for the win. They, they got their win because they waited for the right opportunity and they did it with a lot of planning, a lot of elegance, and also, yes, timing. Finally, number 10 on this list is Blood Rage. Blood Rage is my number one game of all time. It is my personal favorite game. You see, I didn't use the word great this time. Blood Rage is a game that has, this is also in the, the Rising Sun and Ankh trilogy by Eric Lang and Cool Mini or Not. Blood Rage is a game that also has drafting, but it has it, it, it almost combines the best parts of Innis, I would say, and then also Kemet. Now, it has the drafting aspect of your picking cards that are going to define your, your round. You have three rounds, three ages, and every round you're going to pick a bunch of cards. You're going to draft them and pass them around, pick another card, pass them around until you end up with a, a hand of six cards that will define your possibilities for the round. Some of those cards will be upgrades, permanent upgrades to your clients throughout the game. Remember how uh, Kemet had tons of power tiles that everyone has, has access to? Blood Rage doesn't have an open smorgasbord of power tiles. Instead, Blood Rage has these cards. All of these cards are going to be a combination of power cards that will up your, your abilities throughout the entire game. Suddenly, you can do things other players can't. Some of those cards will be combat cards that will help you win combat. Other cards will be quests that will help you give you different incentives, of both points as well as stat upgrades. And then ultimately, it all meets in the middle in this central board that basically has one middle spot and then a whole bunch of edge spots to that middle. So nothing is more than two spots away, and even movement in this game isn't really two spots. You can just move anywhere for an action. This game is about knowing that anyone at any time can enter the battle that you just started. Anyone can jump in to take advantage of the fact that you're a blood-hungry person who wants power and the abilities and whatever. Everyone can jump in on that battle and fight it out with you. Now, if you lock the battle spaces, if you get enough people in there, there's less room for others to join. And that's a huge part of the game of trying to plan out when to conduct conduct battle, where to conduct battle, and with what hand of cards to conduct battle. Blood Rage is a tense game. This is one of those games that every time you play it, you want to be standing up. You, you want to be pacing. You can't keep, you can't just sit down and hope for the best. You want to just like stare at the table, grit your teeth, jump in, hope for the best, and hopefully end with the most points. Or alternatively, you can go the Loki strategy and just die a lot and help you win that way. The Loki strategy is an incredible balancing factor to this game in the sense that it it doesn't just prioritize winning. It prioritizes, it gives you advantages for losing because you can't always win everything. Sometimes you have to lose. And when if you time Loki cards to losing, you don't have to go full Loki. You can go, you can try to win and still have one or two Loki cards that will incentivize losing here and there. But it really does balance an incredible game with a lot of real tough decisions to be made throughout the course of the game. I hope you found this list helpful. I hope you found this useful. If you've played Risk, if you like what Risk gives you, First of all, try Risk 2210, which I mentioned offhand. Jump into Small World next, and from there, pick any of the games on this list. They are a lot. I don't recommend going straight from Risk to any of these games. Have something in the middle, have a Small World, have a Nexus Ops somewhere in the middle. But after that, 
there are so many incredible experiences that will give you all the good things that Risk gives you, but with a lot more streamlined design. A lot less, none of these games have player elimination. Player elimination where one of your friends is sitting off the side of the table. But this is, these games are very rewarding. They are very engaging. They are great substitutes to Risk. If you enjoy Risk and you want to see something, see something more, try out these games. I hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, I'm Alex from Board Game Co. If you like this stuff, go ahead and subscribe. You can click the link down below. All good things. Uh, you can head on over to our site, boardgameco.com, where you can buy, sell, or trade board games. And until next time, have a good one.